Okay, I know first I have on the list was Cindy. I know I saw her out there, but I see that maybe we can just move on because we do have to, I know that they're saying we have to be out of the room, I think by 4.30 because that's when everybody is gonna be picked up to go to the um, barbecue. So we will not forget Cindy, but maybe we can move to Rhonda. Rhonda, do you want to ask your question or make your comment, please? Sure. My name is Rhonda Bagelot, Region 3. Um, my, it's apparent to me that a tremendous amount of collective effort has gone into the Constitution to this point. And um, subsequent to ratification, it sounds to me like there's going to still be a fair bit of work involved, starting with the Transition Committee. Um, as sort of an extension of what Melanie was talking about, I'd like to better understand how appointments to, and that was the word I heard, how appointments are made to these committees. Um, I believe we have tremendous depth, skill, and expertise among our citizens, and I would like to see a more robust selection process when appointing folks to these committees. On a final note, I did hear one of the committees say, committee me commission members rather say, that we espouse to provide meaningful representation of women. I, although my shorthand's not great, I looked down the list of folks appointed to the transition committee and we fall grossly short of having meaningful representation of women on that committee. Okay, thank you for that, Rhonda. So how that committee was appointed was a resolution at the last year's assembly that clearly said in the resolution that the only two people that were appointed was myself and Vice President Dan Cardinal. Those were the only two people. We didn't appoint anyone. Then the resolution clearly said that there would be two people selected from each region. Now what we do with that is send that notice out to the elected leadership in the region to select those people. And yes, we noticed too that there was only, um, I think two other than myself, two women. We did notice that, but that's the selection that the way it was, the resolution was put forward, and that's what we did. Okay, so I, I do appreciate that, but I do know that presidents and other represent representatives of the existing territories are here, and they need to hear what we are seeing. Okay, thank you very much. Now I'm gonna go back, Cindy, I didn't forget you. I'm gonna go back to Cindy. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Cindy, I'm a knowledge keeper. Um, you mentioned that we were going to, every member of the m and is going to be able to vote on the Constitution in the fall. Is this a guarantee? That is a guarantee. Okay. I will say that is a guarantee. I don't know if you've seen the booth that's set yes. up out there. They are finding every possible way to ensure that every citizen has an opportunity in some fashion to be able to vote. If it, if if it passes. <clears throat> okay. Like it, that's if I, it, I just want to clarify that. The, Everybody that wants to vote can vote. Not every citizen votes. It's, if you don't oh. want to vote, you don't vote. Oh, I understand that. That's with any election. So Yeah, and I did, I did, the other thing I just, as Travis has indicated to me, is that's the wor work we've been doing right now okay. because of the resolution that went forward. That's set up so if it passes tomorrow, that's what happens. If it doesn't pass tomorrow, then we know that there's going to be no vote right away. We need to go back to another another process. Okay. Okay. So it is in the resolution for tomorrow. Pardon me. Is it in the resolution for tomorrow to be voted on? There is a resolution that is coming forward tomorrow. Yes. Okay. I have another question. Um, the M and A talks about that they're going to support all its citizens and everything. Um, I'm a knowledge keeper, and I notice a lot of my seniors and elders a lot of the locals with disabilities. But our small local, it's expensive for us to bring members up here. And I wanna know if the M&A is gonna start helping the smaller 
your er, small rural areas to come to conventions like this or to come to a voting so that we can vote when we can't afford to bring our members up here, but the MA can. So will they be guaranteeing in our constitution that they will support and help us do these things? Okay. So, right now, we have a structure. And we do help citizens. But the structure is very, very clearly. There's a provincial level, there's a regional level, and there's a local level. And from every since, long before I was president, ever since I knew how that system worked, the province, brings thing down to the regional level. The regional level brings it to the local level. The local level takes it to the citizens. That's the process that's in place for years and years and years. So what we do, and it's for this very assembly, what we do is once we know what we have for money to come, it is provincial council who makes the decision. They made a motion that $20,000 would go to each region to help citizens. We also made a motion that we would supply 10 rooms for citizens from each region to be able to ha stay in hotels. And then the other money, the region decides what to do with. So there is, there has been, and as far as the new government, I believe it's gonna be a different structure, but I believe based on the self-government agreement we've signed, there will be resources to support provincial level, district level, whatever we need to do. There will be, I, well, I shouldn't say whatever we need to do because you know we, the, there's never enough, but um, I believe it'll be very much more lucrative than what we've been operating with today. And I say that because until we signed our federal agreement, we basically had nothing to work with. We had a budget that was two, approximately $2 million. Out of that, uh, we had a $1.5 million with the province. That was very clear, $169,000 to each region. Nothing for locals. And as much as we lobbied every year, the provincial government had a, had a standard reply, sorry, there's no more money, there's no raise, and no, we can't support locals. That has totally changed with our federal government negotiations. And we are very clearly talking about, with this constitution, when we go to a new structure, we need to make sure that we have enough to support, regardless of how many district offices there are. Exact, make sure that our citizens' gatherings are supported. All of those things, that's what we've been doing at the, at the federal government negotiating that. So we are, we are trying to help as much as we can right now, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And, and it has come down. There has been money come down from the province to the regional to the locals. That's the structure that works today. I think Travis wants to respond to that as well. So go ahead, Travis. Thank you. I, I only just want to add very briefly that um, in regards to your first question as well, the, the, uh, the ratification, if, if we're uh, able to go to that, will um, allow people to vote in different ways, in different places where they are, so that we want to hear everybody's voice. The more people that we can encourage to vote, the better. And so we, we want... Uh, we want people to be able to vote from wherever they are. And even in the future, the Constitution describes the citizens gathering that's a place for us to, um, to do many of the things that we do today here at our, at our annual General Assembly. But one of the big differences is the, the laws will be made by people that are elected by people in, in their districts and, and in their communities. So they're going to be voting for people without having to come to a central place or, or one place to, to vote on the particular laws. They're able to vote 
for their representatives from wherever they are. I, so, I don't, yeah, that's all I wanted to add. So each okay. person in each district will have the right to vote and have something to say about who is in their head of their district and who will be making the decisions for them and they will have the right to talk to about each of those decisions? They'll have the, they'll have the right to vote for, for the people representing them and the, those representatives are tasked with consulting with their districts in the Constitution specifically to, to consult with the people in their districts about the laws that are being proposed. Okay. And okay. we'll have okay. laws standing saying that if they don't consult, there will be consequences? I imagine in the Code of Conduct, right? I would imagine that will be built into the laws, whether that's the Code of Conduct or however those, okay. those laws are developed. I think we have our legal okay. wants to, just wait, our legal has and Karen has um, wants to respond to your question as well. Okay, great. Go ahead, Zach. So I, I just wanted to point out that you did put your finger on some issues with the way that the m a is currently governed. But those issues flow, you know, directly from two things and really from the fact that the m a has been forced to structure itself as a society. The m a has to follow the Societies Act, which means that there must be an annual General Assembly. It's got to be in person. If there's going to be a change to the bylaws, it has to be by special resolution. Those are things over which you have no control because you don't have self-government. And if you have issues with the fact that, you know, a special assembly can be called to change the bylaws or that it's difficult for people to come here, uh, those are issues with the Societies Act. And really, I think that's a symptom of the fact that you've reached the point that you need self-government. Uh, the other issue, and this is something I touched on this morning, is because you're a society, you are financed through contribution agreements, which do have a lot of strings attached and don't allow the M&A to make decisions in the way that Audrey alluded to, to share resources in the way that might best support citizens to participate in the democratic process. So again, the answer to that kind of concern is self-government. Okay, thank, thank you, you, Zach. Uh, Karen, has, Karen wants to respond to you as well, Cindy. Well, it's, it's just to add to the first, your first part of the question with okay. respect to the voting. I just want to remind all of the citizens in this room, and if we get a chance, we should remind them again tomorrow, the booth that's out there for the Constitution Commission, we have some registrar people there that, and they're taking the information is, how do you want to vote? Okay. Are you, do you want to vote in person? Do you want to be contacted by email? Uh, how? they're taking that kind of information so that we can we can better try and um, do the ratification process based on some of those numbers that we get from the crowd here that says I want to do it in person if they're if people are um, incapacitated and can't go to a polling station that information is going to be gathered there as well so that we know if there's a particular uh, household that we need to attend to so that somebody can vote that's the, that's the kind of information we're gathering there. So thank you for raising that. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Karen. Thanks, Cindy. Okay, we're going to go over to Brian. Thank you, Madam President. Brian Hamlin, Southern Free Maidy Territory. I have a couple uh, questions regarding the three important positions under uh, Part 5-6. Part 6 the chair, the ombudsman, the auditor general. Now, we have committees coming out of the Citizens Council that do uh, two different processes for electing or nominating or, or getting these positions. What I'd like to know is why the position for chair has a list of nominees that are elected by the council and on the other hand, the Ombudsman and the Auditor General are nominated by the, by the committee itself and then approved or ratified by the council. And also, does this mean that the term for these three positions expires with every provincial election? Is that, was that 17, you said? Part six. Part six. 
Page 17, for those following along, it's the three positions of Chair, Ombudsman, and Auditor General. So I'll, um, I'll answer, uh, the, some responses come to my mind specifically on the Ombudsman and Auditor General, and maybe I'll speak to those ones first. Um, the intent of those two uh, positions is, is intended to be very much independent of, of the elected offices, if you will, to perform a very specific, impartial, independent function. Um, and with respect to the term, that's actually a very good question, but I can tell you that the office itself and how, how that office will work, again, I know we keep saying that, but it is the case, is th those type of details will be spelled out in the law that needs to be developed. So we identify as a commission that there's a, a need for that type of role um, and we even had a lot of debate and discussion and, and feedback about the name, but nonetheless the functions of an ombudsman office as well as the auditor general, independent, impartial, standalone, very clear functions, but those terms would be something that's contemplated to be spelled out in the law. Okay. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, just further to that, uh, so we have for the chairperson, the, uh, the committee will then prepare a list of nominees and I imagine those will be submitted from the Métis Nation itself and the citizens. And then from there the council will select one of those nominees for the chair. Now what happens if one of these positions we find out the, uh, they're not performing their duties and responsibility? Is there a process to recall these positions or replace them? <laughs> Again, I know we keep, so Brian, I, can, I know we keep saying the same thing, but um, we are within the constitution, you can't have all the criteria. So what we're suggesting and has been talked about is that a law would be developed as to what would happen in that very case you're asking about. Okay, and one subsequent point. We have these committees choosing these three positions, and yet for the very important position of acting president, we have the president solely making that appointment in case of an act, acting position instead of the council voting on that interim president. Could you tell me why the council is not making that decision? So, Brian, I've been around with this Métis Nation forever, and I'll just be blunt about it. You've seen the vice president sitting there being elected to the president, and all they do is fight. I actually, I can't say that about Danny, but I can say that that has been, and actually, Muriel was very good, so there's been other ones. So we decided that's not a very effective way to to uh, put people there. And you go to a premier or the uh, prime minister, they put, they assign their deputies to themselves. So that's where we're born on that model of that idea. Uh, in the other situations, it would be the same if the citizens uh, council was to appoint them, it would be their person. So we don't, we're trying to avoid lots of conflict if we can do that. The intent here is to have a smooth running government. <coughs> Okay, thank you, and one final point. Now, we have an article that says the Constitution may not be amended for five years following the force. I, I read the literature on why you want to do that, but if I bought a brand new car, expected to drive it for five years and it ran out of oil or had a flat tire, I'd want to fix that right away, not wait five years. Okay, thank you for that, thank you. We hear you. Okay, we had Melanie, you were next. So first off, uh, I wanna say, can we make this a gender friendly document or do you just mean that only men can be ombudsman persons? <laughs> and yeah. uh, actually Melanie on that, we went round and round in circles on what do we, what do we call it and, and 
it was ombudsman just because that seems to be, and we, we said ombudsperson and everyone was no everywhere we went and we were trying to think what else it could be and it was basically because we didn't have come up with anything else. Don't, I just want to remind you guys, I was a part of the Métis Nation when it was illegal for a woman to sit at the Métis National Council table. They weren't, based on the bylaws, allowed to represent Métis people there. So we should use ombudsperson and have a gender-friendly document. But okay, I, I want to ask this question. So I know that today there's been different things put forward from a variety of people, including myself. And I know that you guys as commissioners are going to look at that. So, and I want to say I do support a constitution. I, ha I will have no problems voting and supporting moving forward with a constitution. But I want to know how you're going to take today's input and feed it into that document before it goes for ratification. Nobody has an answer. I'm going to try to, I'm not going to try to answer, Mel. I'm just going to say, geez, you. <laughs> what happens, you know, uh, when it's true, uh, you know, sometimes there's pieces we miss and uh, Mel never fails to find them and we're like, oh, and, and you know what? We need to fix it too. There's no other way to get out of it. And so we need to sit here and talk amongst ourselves. Do we want to spend a few more months before we move into ratification? Just so you guys know. So we'll have to bump that down because there was a lot of great, a lot of great ideas we can't ignore here today. So I'm going to, I'm, I'm just saying it right here to the team. I don't, I don't know. We haven't talked about it. So I'm, we're probably going to have a conversation about how much time do we need to do to, to clean this up, and then put, put the piece out to ratify, to be ratified. Okay, I'm Brian. Oh, Travis, you want to go ahead? Um, I, I think over the past, I guess, couple of years, uh, in particularly, you know, several months, we've heard so many uh, insights, so many good ideas about how to improve it, and we've worked hard to try to incorporate that. There are some things where there's just different opinions on them, so we tried to represent in here uh, the ideas that we think were um, in the spirit of what people were asking for. I guess the truth is it will probably never be perfect. It'll probably never reflect everybody's perspective exactly right. Um, uh, so I, I don't know. I, I guess uh, I, I guess I hope it's it's close enough to to what you had told us and what your vision is that that you can support it. That's all. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Travis. Um, I just want to respond to you as well, Melanie. Is that we did come here today bringing another draft. <coughs> Hearing from people, it was time to move on. Certainly having um, a resolution from our provincial council that was to go to that special assembly and extend it a year. Uh, we also had another provincial council meeting just last week that they put another motion forward uh, to ask citizens to support the constitution. So for me, that's where I'm at, is that that is coming forward. Whatever the citizens decide is what, be what, what it will be. We cannot change it at this point. We've brought it forward. There's a resolution that's going to come to the assembly. It'll be voted on. And if it's not passed, yes, we'll have to look at what is that next thing now, the next go around. Is that more community consultations? Is that some other type of different process that's used? That'll be up to the commission. Because the commission has a job until it's ratified. So if it's, if it's defeated tomorrow, then that's where we'll go. 
and make sh and and definitely we've been recording everything everyone has said today so it's not like we're not listening we will hear it all but based on how this process has happened there will be a resolution come tomorrow and it will be up to the citizens and for me it'll be whatever those citizens decide is what will go forward and that's when we will have to decide definitely take into consideration all this but what is that next piece that has to go forward and, and like Brian says we haven't talked about that yet so we'll we'll work on that okay Jude. I don't Jude. see anybody else uh, so we'll go to Jude thank you my name is Jude Daniels I grew up in region six but uh, currently live in region three um, my family is originally from the Red River, Métis, Red River Métis homeland, uh, the Daniels family. Um, and my great-great-grandfather sold Métis Nation of Asso maybe um, M&A Association memberships back in the 1930s. They cost three cents. It was a fundraiser, actually. And so I know he would be very, very proud to see this day because it truly is an historic moment for their people. I mean, the reality is we have outgrown our current governance structure. It's just old. It doesn't work anymore. It's broken. So I'm thrilled to be here. I was thrilled to see that we finally have our own constitution, and I truly hope that it will be passed. Um, I have to say that I, I agree with most of it, um, but it's, and I don't think it's a perfect document. I don't think it'll ever be a perfect document. However, it does, as was mentioned earlier, it's a functional document. And I think that's as good as we're gonna get. And the reality is, is that at some point in time, well, in fact, in five years, if we wanted to amend it, we certainly could. And I also wanted to say um, thank you very much to the commission for doing all of this work on our behalf. There has been a lot of changes, a lot. I know you guys have worked really hard. The people in this room, I could tell, are very, very passionate about us and about what we have accomplished together as a nation. And I have to say, this is an incredibly proud day for me. And I'm just thrilled, thrilled, that we finally have a constitution we can be proud of. That's all I wanted to say, thank you. Thank you very much, Jude. Uh, Jenna. Jenna, where are you, Jenna? There you are, okay. Does number three work? Okay. I had my other question from earlier today. Uh, still Jenna, still Otipim Swack from within Alberta. Uh, I'm going to save that question though, because as I was learning here today, um, another um, sort of question came about and I really I want to echo that sentiment I'm really grateful for the work that's been done by the commissioners um, many of you I know very well and I trust all of you and um, that's why I bring this uh, question uh, for clarity as well as uh, perhaps the consideration of of um, enhancing this this section of my concern. Um, we hear Jenna. Okay, yeah, honey. I've got my little Sonny here too. He's my good one, but he's being feisty. He's been patient all day. So in um, chapter 27.1, um, under the no effect on Métis rights, claims, and interests, it says that nothing in our Constitution limits, prejudices, restricts, or surrenders any right, claim, or interest of the Métis Nation within Alberta, the communities of its territories, or any components of either. Uh, which is kind of, you know, timely. I'll mention my little guy here. I, if there's anything that we're forgetting or missing, I need the space available for the next generations to be able to enter into the conversation and correct those um, misses if it requires us to do such. When I go to section 21.2, the legacy of script and land claim agreements section, um, 
sorry, bear with me here. It talks about how uh, the legacy of Métis script must be recognized and redressed through the Otapimsuak Métis government on behalf of the Métis nation within Alberta. So I'm just wondering how those two clauses would fit together, um, knowing that what uh, Zach Davis kind of presented this morning on the fact that uh, the Métis nation within Alberta doesn't necessarily represent all of Métis within Alberta and that there's sort of that opt-in process, if you will, or later negotiations with the settlements, for example. Um, but then in 28.1, where it talks about treaty ratification, it sort of, I guess, giving ourselves the ultimate authority to, um, I guess, negotiate our outstanding land claim agreements. So to me, that's contradictory to the non-abrogation clause that's um, listed in the, um, sorry, in the 27.1 chapter. So my question is, is if that is all to kind of be, um, I guess, accurate in what I've interpreted, uh, back to section um, 28.1, I'm wondering if the commission and if um, our collective might consider amending um, the ratification to um, a referendum because when we're talking about negotiating land claim agreements that have we've been fighting for for I mean over 90 years almost a hundred years formally um, it would probably necessitate more than the limited ratification requirements under chapter 28 thank you That's a whole bunch of questions, and it sounds pretty legal to me, so probably Lisa or, or Zach need to. Oh, Zach, go ahead. Thank you. Those are, those are great questions, and they really indicate that you read it very closely. Um, there's a few issues, and I would say the, I, I'll start trying to answer all the questions by dividing the issues into two categories, rights and representation. So when the... Constitution says it, it doesn't have any effect, it doesn't um, abrogate or derogate from your Section 35 protected Aboriginal rights. That's true. You know, that's not even something that this Constitution could do. Uh, those rights are protected by the Constitution of Canada, the Constitution Act 1982. And as I explained this morning, they inhere in you as Indigenous people. They are inherent rights. One of the biggest hurdles, though, that the Métis Nation has faced in advocating for its rights and having its rights recognized is working out who can speak for the collectives that hold those rights. And it is an issue that has held you back, I'll be frank. Um, it, for better or for worse, it was never questioned in the First Nations world because First Nations were corralled onto reserves and they had their traditional governments destroyed and that was replaced by Indian Act bans and Canadian courts just took for granted that Indian Act bans were the right people to speak on behalf of the collectives. That's the First Nation colonial experience. The Métis colonial experience is one of really being ignored by Canada. Um, and to your great credit, you organized yourselves with the tools available, the Societies Act. But the Societies Act was never a tool that was meant to solve the problem of who represents constitutionally rights-holding groups. And so it remains really the biggest obstacle to overcome when we do work for the MNA around issues like a consultation and around issues like script, because nothing prevents any self-appointed person from coming out of the woodwork and saying, I'm going to take on the script claim. And in fact, that's what happened. So it, recently in northeastern Alberta, there was litigation started by about 16 self-appointed people saying that they were going to 
seek redress for Scrip for all Métis people in, with any connection whatsoever to northeastern Alberta and northwestern Saskatchewan. Um, none of those people <coughs> were elected by that region. None of those people were involved in the MNA. And the MNA stood up and went to court and challenged their representativity. And as a result of that, they knew that they, they couldn't meet the test, that they didn't speak for the group, and they all abandoned the claim. So um, you know, that's a step in the right direction. I think we'll talk more about script tomorrow, and there is an urgent need to take action to resolve and redress script. But it can't be done unless you transform yourself from a society that can be ignored to a government that can't. And so the provisions of the Constitution that speak to how these claims will be advanced and that they will be advanced through the government attempt to solve that problem. They attempt to get over that last hurdle so that you can have redress for script, you can have your consultation rights respected, you can advance other rights, because if you don't lock down a government that can do that, that has that mandate, Canada and the province will continue to ignore you. Thank you, I appreciate that. <clears throat> Just to be, um, I'm wondering if we could sort of modify that, those words within the Constitution, because the last thing I want to do is have Canada use our own Constitution against us to say, well, you said this in one vein and then this in the other. Uh, and it might make a more challenging argument to say um, that we do in one side, but then we don't in the other. Um, and then again, I would just reiterate, I would love any decision making that has to do with uh, outstanding land claims that are beyond uh, multiple generations uh, to have a referendum as opposed to a ratification with the existing structure outlined in, I think, chapter 28. Okay, thank you very much for that, Jenna. Um, we're gonna move on to um, number two. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Jeff Shalafu again. Just a, a couple of uh, uh, process questions that I have. One of them, uh, tomorrow's vote, what's the threshold? How many percentage or how much percentage of the people uh, present uh, can pass this uh, uh, resolution to uh, adopt this new constitution? And secondly, would the uh, commission or whoever's chairing, would they be open to amendments uh, to, that, to that constitution tomorrow? And the reason why I say that is although the, the Constitution itself as presented is very positive and uh, uh, forward moving, but there might be some sections in there that, that might need a little bit of tweaking. Would the, would the, the, the Commission then uh, 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 allow for amendments uh, to the Constitution before it's, uh, before it's passed? Wow. Well, uh, so on your first question, because this constitution is not part of our bylaws that require a special resolution. This is, will be an ordinary resolution and we know that's 50 plus one, right? Okay. So that's what'll happen there. As far as the amendments, I'm not quite, so uh, somebody can tell me if I'm wrong, but I think because what we've done with this constitution right from day one, is done a process and then said this is what we heard from the citizens and brought the next one back and this is what we heard from the citizens and brought the next one back i'm not really sure if we can make amendments on the on the fly or not i i somebody else probably legally needs to answer that the um <laughs> the reason that there was such a robust consultative process was to ensure that citizens from everywhere in Alberta had a voice yeah. in the Constitution. So, uh, you know, the resolution tomorrow will present this as the sum total of, of all that feedback that was had. And, you know, obviously forums like this are important. If the resolution passes, I think it will go forward the way it's written. If it doesn't pass, um, then there'll need to be some contemplation about how uh, we get a constitution that people could support moving forward to a ratification process, and that will involve amendments. Uh, the question of what was, are you going to allow amendments to, uh, to, to the document? 
No, the, the resolution tomorrow would be to move forward for a ratification process on this constitution. If it doesn't pass, we can talk about amendments. One final question uh, on the uh, on the ratification vote. Is there a threshold, a, a number that you're looking for? 50% 50, 50 of 54,000, which is the membership, or 50% of the uh, of the people that voted? Uh, I, I just what we're looking at right now is 50% uh, of the people that vote provided that a sufficient number of people vote to really reflect the opinion of the Métis Nation oh. as a whole. Okay, thank you for those questions. Um, number four, I don't have your name there. I think you were next. It's Bo Bobby Paul Aluk okay, I from Region 6. I can't see very good. <laughs> okay. So um, I just have a couple of uh, questions or clarifications. Um, so one of the goals of the, of the new government right from the beginning has been kind of a commitment to decentralize our government and place the decision making and all the other um, authorities and responsibilities listed in chapter 15 in district councils. Um, I just have some questions about some of the language that's in this, this latest draft regarding district councils and um, kind of the little bit of a gray area that I see that it puts as far as the commitment to um, that decentralization of, of, of the power. Um, so the first one is 15.3, where it says East, each district may have a district council. Um, and then, um, so unless I missed it in the previous drafts, the, in, the other two drafts, it said that each district would have a council. So that's something um, that I'm just wondering why that language was changed. And then um, something else that kind of points to um, maybe a lack of commitment to making that happen is 15.6b, where it says additional councillors um, could be added, but no kind of real explanation or definition on what that district council looks like. Um, and then the last one is 15.9 uh, where it says no district council has been established. If no, where no district council has been established, um, basically that the, um, that the citizens council can do their work. Um, so I'm just wondering kind of how those extra pieces in this latest draft how, if there's any implications at all to kind of the, the original commitment to that decentralization and the, the creation of district councils where, with that idea that the people are going to be making decisions and controlling what's happening within their local areas more so than what's being done now. Um, and then I also was wondering, is there going to be capacity funding and support to establish district councils? Um, uh, because one of the busy, biggest challenges that we face right now um, at, the local, at the level of, of our locals is um, a lack of funding for our local councils. Most of our local councils are made up of volunteers, which obviously um, often limits the le level of time and commitment that council members can put into the work that they're doing for their locals. Um, and I'm just wondering, will the district captain and those councillors have paid positions, will there be capacity funding for office space, staff, district council positions, all of those things that would kind of further that commitment. Um, with the changes in the language in this draft, I see less of a commitment to that decentralization and putting the power at the local, in the hands of the local people than in the previous drafts. And um, to me, that's a little bit concerning. So I don't know if you can answer that question. And then I do have a follow-up question about um, the district council maps after. Okay, I'm going uh, to <laughs> give the first kick at the cat and I ask any of my, my colleagues to uh, chime in. So um, we had a long, drawn-out discussion about districts and how we could add more responsibility because that's one of the things that we heard from our rounds was that we gave authority and responsibility to other levels but we didn't do so at the district so we we've add more meat meat to that with respect to the 
to the May piece. When we looked at our map and we looked at um, our current um, activity of, of locals, of our structure as it is throughout the province, there were many areas in our mapping of districts that didn't currently have locals. So that was a bit of a concern. And so we thought that if, if, if there was not an existing local there that was gonna smoothly slide into a district, then there had to be some mechanism to ensure that those people that lived within those districts would still have services provided and other functions of the central government provided to them. So therefore that we put the, the 59 in there to ensure that service delivery would still come to those, to those citizens. We also thought really hard about it and thought that perhaps this might be a way, and I'm really glad that you caught that, that this might be a way to um, for lack of a better way to say, is to waken up, wake up our citizens that live in some of those districts and say, get yourselves organized, form yourself a district council, be part of the process of the new government. So that leaves that open for many districts to begin organizing. There may be some district areas that do not get organized, but still want to provide the service. So therefore we put in that clause to ensure that some of those services there. We also talked about um, uh, some districts, because currently some of our locals right now focus in particular areas. Some might be culture, some might be uh, <coughs> services to seniors, some might be, they, they pick and choose different areas of program and service delivery. We also thought about that and thought that perhaps there are going to be some districts that continue to maintain that particular kind of focus. And in those specific areas, perhaps to ensure, again, to ensure that those services and, and programs are delivered in, in that area, that there would be some give and take between the both levels to ensure that they were brought to that district. Um, The, yeah, and the only other piece where it said additional um, counselors might be added to the district. We, um, we know, and again, it's like we've said earlier, that there will be a law that will be drafted around districts. And we expect that within that drafting of that law that there be consideration as to how large of a district council is there, is there gonna be? How small can a district council be? Can it just end up being just a district captain and, and one counselor? We tried to leave that open so that the citizens within that district could make some of those decisions. With respect to the, the piece that you asked about the uh, will those positions be funded? Because currently, like you said, many of those positions are, are, are volunteer. We expect, because we heard, we heard that too in many of our engagements, we, ex we know and we expect that we will transfer that information to the transition com committee, to the laws committee, as well as to the table that is going to be looking at the, um, the, funding, um, the funding piece. And so we have had much discussion around that and I invite any of my colleagues if they want to add. Okay, is there anyone else? I can too. Brian, go ahead. So what I heard you say, what I think I heard you say then, as the question around May, you got, you got stuck on that and it had said you should. So what this says is any district that's been created uh, can create a district council if they want to. That's what this is saying. It may. You don't have to. That's what it's also saying. So should you decide to do that? There's a whole list of roles, responsibilities, authorities that follow that. So if you you decided up in Fort Vermillion, 
I just remember, you know, when I went up to Fort Vermilion after you said your name, and uh, I thought you were doing an awesome job, but I can, I can just see you guys wanting to create your district council and seek resources for that to make it happen. So that would be good for you. All right, thanks, Brian. Uh, you said you did have another question, I think, Bobby. I did. Um, thank you for your answers. Uh, again, my feedback is just that the, the May is, is kind of an issue for me. I think, like what Karen had said about the hope is that it kind of um, wakes up the districts that don't have anything going on and kind of gives them a kick in the butt to get things. Nothing is going to kick you more in the butt than if we actually have it in our constitution that you have to have a district council um, like it had in the, pre in the previous two drafts. Uh, that's just my opinion on that one. And then um, the other comment that you made, Karen, kind of will segue into my next question. You said that... Um, that some of the district areas that, that are currently mapped out don't have um, existing locals or kind of anything really happening. So I just wanna speak a bit to the change in the district maps that we've seen in this draft um, and ask a question um, about why the, the feedback that we provided wasn't followed up on. Um, members and locals within Region 6 as well as the Region 6 self office itself um, provided feedback requesting changes to the district boundaries in our area um, at multiple different points of engagement. The proposed changes were requested to better reflect the historic and existing connections between our communities, um, our population distribution in our region, and um, the location of long-standing and well-established and successful locals. Um, I, like I said, I'm not seeing these requested changes reflected in this draft. Um, can you please provide your reasonings for why you didn't incorporate this, this feedback um, into the current draft and what, if any, further criteria would we have had to show um, that would have made us considerable for um, changing our district boundaries to better reflect those, especially when we're talking about, um, you know, some districts that don't have anything going on, whereas um, we have a region with six long-standing, well-established, successful locals, um, and only three districts. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Bobby. Who's speaking to that? Well, I, I could speak a little bit. There you go. Okay. Hey, thanks, Bobby. Um, so, I, I wish I had the... Uh, the previous version on me because I, I can't remember for sure, but I, I believe the... Uh, We've had three from the start. Right. But I think the borders changed between uh, the second draft and this draft. So if I remember correctly, the there was a boundary running north-south that now runs east-west, uh, reflecting so I believe some of the maps that we had. Other commissioners, am I? Yeah, for, so, so those were from Peace River's engagement. I think um, the other, yeah, I, so I, I think we did try to incorporate that. We actually had requested the addition of two more districts, specifically one for the Grand Prairie area and um, kind of a change, uh, I don't know, kind of like a diagonal line across that, that District 13. And well, kind of actually just kind of a change in the border, I think, um, from between 13 and 14 and then the addition of another line in there. We had submitted several copies of maps um, and I believe a letter went in from the Region 6 office and yeah. Just, just wondering if there's anything else, any more information that you would have needed, um, because for us, really, especially, I mean, and I'm not speaking um, about the district, that would be where my local is. I'm talking more about the, 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 um, the districts that we have for 13 and 14. Um, we really, everybody kind of had heard that loud and clear at our regional table, that they felt that not only you know, with the community connections and uh, like historical and current and um, the establishment of their locals and, and but also their interests, their community interests um, really 
kept them as distinct communities and and we felt like made a good um, you know a good pitch for having two more district boundaries there so um, I everything you're describing Bobby are the things that we wanted to consider when we were looking at them I I guess the only thing I can sort of say today now is these boundaries are they're not part of the Constitution in the sense that um, I think there's probably still some flexibility on on changing them because they would be part of a law rather than uh, rather than actually like even though it's printed in the Constitution here it's it's just for the purposes of, of the engagement and the discussion so um, I maybe those things can be reflected uh, in the final version I, I don't I wish I could speak more to it I don't know more beyond that about what Anyone else have anything? So, so if, if that's something that you're willing to consider, can you give some feedback or direction to us as a region then what you are looking for? What do we need to show you? Um, like what's the criteria? What, what do we need to show you um, so that we can make those changes happen? So I, I think Travis is absolutely right. The districts are not in the Constitution, there will be a law. The Constitution requires that that law set out criteria. So there, you will see the criteria, and there is some room for ongoing discussion about those district boundaries. Although a lot of thinking did go into it, um, the criteria will be plain and obvious. It will be outlined in that law. All right, thank you. Thanks, Bobby. Okay, um, number one. Thank you. I just want to start with a comment before my question. I want to thank, um, and I hope you get your name right, Brian Fayant. I want to thank you. It takes leadership to hear the questions that came today. You know, we have lawyers, political scientists. Our nation is rich with people. And unlike people who are paid, their only material interest is that of their nation. And I think it's sobering to hear you acknowledge that there were great questions asked. You know, my position as a leader at a Lethbridge, third biggest municipality, we wrote letters asking to be consulted. And we wrote letters expressing concerns that we were not adequately consulted. We thought about having our own constitution sessions, but we didn't need to because the Métis people here own themselves and they ask the right questions. So my point to the leadership, and that's the provincial council, I have ordinary resolutions scheduled for tomorrow. I got a bunch of them. It doesn't mean that I have to bring them forward. Responsive leadership listens to the citizens. They take that feedback. It's not enough for this to be functional. There's a fine line between a democracy and a dictatorship. It needs fixes. The minor points are important. That's my first point. My question is to our legal counsel, you know, you mentioned this point about our funding agreements hamstringing the ability, or at least under the Society's Acts to filter under. Tell that to Rocky Mountain House, whose doors were about to close two months ago. My question is this, how moving to a constitution is gonna actually ensure that funding flows down? We've asked for the federal contribution agreements. We've asked for it on behalf of our local. We've asked for it on behalf of the region. We've asked the federal government. If you wanna represent us, we need answers. We've got none. Thank you. Thank you. Number two. Thank you very much. I'd like to start out by saying, Madame Portra, I'd like to express my congratulations for uh, your achievements so far, you and your board, uh, I appreciate how much work you've gone through, and we got more work to do. My concern today here right now is selfishly under uh, section 6.1e. <clears throat> and my concern is with the wording, and I wonder if somebody could clarify that for me. This is a kind of a two-part thing. But if you'll have a look, it says the right to harvest resources of the Métis Nation homeland. When I saw that, I thought, great, 
Finally, we've been fighting for years to have the recognition of our rights across all the Métis homeland. A lot of harvesters have asked for this, and of course we, we, we get blocked, we get stopped. And I thought, well, this is great. The board has finally recognized that there might be a possibility to hunt across our homeland. And then I go further and read, and in keeping with the customs, practices, and traditions of the Métis Nation within Alberta. So then it, it tells me that, well, we talk about the homeland, but now we're, we're back to within the borders of the m and Is that what the intention was? Are we, are, we, are we, in fact, looking at being allowed to hunt across the original Métis homeland, or are we going to be just staying right here in Alberta? So, can I respond? Go ahead. Is there? Go ahead. I got some... So, the, the intention is um, to direct the, the new government that, or, well, just to express the right, I guess, that uh, it is for the Métis Nation homeland. So, and, and earlier in, uh, I guess, probably chapter one, we described the, the homeland as the whole homeland, homeland not just yeah. Alberta. I did see that, yes. Um, so, th that's what the intention is. Of course, like we mentioned a bit earlier, that it's it, adopting the constitution is not going to change the provincial government's position or policy automatically, uh, but it does, I believe, the intention is it'll put us in a stronger position to, to uh, assert that right. I'm glad to hear that, but you just mentioned that we're trying to impress the provincial government, that's the provincial government of Alberta, not the m and I thought we were dealing with the federal government. We are a federal people. You understand what I'm saying? And when we go further to say traditions of the Métis Nation within Alberta, if we are looking at possibly expanding and recon recognition of our rights to the original uh, Métis homeland, then we're actually going to cut our throat with that last statement. It may hamper us, that's all I'm saying. But I am impressed that we're looking. That's great. Thank you. I might be able to add some clarity as to why that language was used. And it comes from the Pali case, which, uh, and other cases that define how the Canadian Constitution protects the Aboriginal right to harvest. And what it protects is um, practice customs and traditions of a rights-bearing Aboriginal collective. And so what we've articulated here is that the Métis Nation within Alberta is that collective. And so it's using the Canadian Constitution, using the notions of your customs, practices, and traditions, we can attempt to expand where the provinces, not just Alberta, but the provinces, recognize your harvesting rights. Because we know mobility across the homeland is a Métis custom practice and tradition. I'm sure everyone here has roots across the homeland, not just limited to Alberta. Courts have defined regional rights-bearing communities and protected their rights that go across provincial boundaries. And so the idea here was to leverage this language in order to do exactly what you're asking for, for us to be able to have harvesting rights recognized throughout the Prairie Provinces. Thank you, and I apologize. I didn't introduce myself. And my name is Guy LaRue. I'm from Pincher Creek, and thank you very much. Thank you, Guy. Okay, we're over to uh, number three. Well, there we go. So I just have three brief questions because it's almost 4.30 and everybody wants to get on the bus. So it's been a long day for you. So we'll start. Uh, there are macro questions about the Constitution. Um, I, I, what did, I'm hearing today... Could you speak your name, please, just for the oh, record? Oh, sorry. Ward Sutherland, Region 3. So what I heard today is a lot of minutia about the Constitution. And the biggest challenge, and if you could expand on this, is the Constitution is just a shell. It's a framework. And all these details are laws. And it's a chicken in the egg. And that's the challenge. Because people want everything at once and all the details. But those laws have to be made first to deal with the details. So how can you express that or communicate that 
uh, in terms of the Constitution and separate those two things. I'm going to try my best. Uh, I kind of attempted that with that young lady talking about uh, the uh, medicine. Let me see what she said now. Medical autonomy. Uh, what I then mentioned was in this piece we talked about health. So the Constitution is a big canvas that we're trying to collect everything in one, one shot. And we can't. But we're, we're hoping to touch enough of those areas such that when you want to pursue health, there's a commentary there that, that allows us to build on it. All these pieces that we have under the rights is, and all the other areas are pieces to build on. So when we create laws, we'll create legislation laws, policies, regulations, that starts taking on a larger, larger frame and larger piece. Uh, and you're right, we're never going to satisfy everybody because it's just, I, I think we captured uh, the majority, 99.2 or 99.9, .9, I think there won't be one point missing, but I think this piece is, is we, what it is, it represents and reflects what everybody said. Uh, so I, I think it's an awesome piece of work. It's not perfect. It, it's like, I, just today we've seen it's not perfect, but it's good. And with, I hope I don't know if I answered that, but yeah, I'm saying you. that this thing is every makes every attempt to capture people's thoughts. Thank you. I'm going to give I'm going to give it a kick at the cat too, and if 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 we don't kick it right, Zach, you cover us. No. <laughs> <laughs> so you're absolutely right. The chicken and the egg dilemma. We had many of those discussions around the transition, around the laws, around numerous things. But the bottom line is, every each time that we came back to it, very, very difficult to draft laws or to talk about transition when we don't know what we're transitioning to. Very difficult to make details around districts, criteria of districts, mapping of districts, those kinds of things, if we don't know if districts is going to be embraced in a constitution. So, albeit, albeit, we're getting closer and closer, but I just don't know if at yet is even the time to be able to draft some of those um, those laws that are because you can we we can you, we can hear which um, areas of the constitution particularly need some clarity for citizens to want to fully embrace the constitution, and I'm. I was just chatting here with my colleagues to say it's that same dilemma. It's difficult, like I just said, difficult to draft laws around a district or a, around elections even if we don't know what are they, how many people are going to be elected. What, and those pieces. So I truly hear you and thank for raising that. But if Zach wants to give it that legal spin about chicken and the egg, give her. Um, I think your question was about communication, and I think you appreciate this dilemma, but how do you communicate it? And the technique the Constitution uses is it, whenever we know there is a gap like this, it says the Otipimsuak Metis government shall maintain a law. And so it points to the, a requirement, a constitutional requirement that that gap be filled. And uh, we had a lot of good questions, and I, that's the answer. Uh, had we drafted them all, we would have far exceeded our mandate. Thank you, Zach. Ward, just before you go to, I know you said you had a couple more questions. So just before you go to it, I just want to say to everyone, I know they told us that it is 4.30. Um, and for people who want to go and catch the bus, I think they are supposed to be out here at 4.30. So I'm just reminding you if you don't want to miss the bus. Ward, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, so the leadership of the m and and the administration have the experience dealing with municipalities, province, and feds. So it would be very helpful if you could explain from your perspective, what's the difference of being a government and a, and a society? What really changes for the Métis Nation? Thank you for that. 
I, I think, and, and maybe everyone will want to speak to it, I'm not sure, but for me, what changes? I think all, what I heard all my life, and I've heard it from leaders year after year after year, the Society Act is not where we, as the Métis people, one of the indigenous peoples of this country, belong. That's living under someone else's rules, and we know what that has caused for a lot of us. We have all kinds of agreements that we have to try to live under and provide the services that are appropriate for our people, and it doesn't work. So for me, that's one big thing, is we would move from moving to a government right now that we're negotiating with for the Métis people that, for themselves to decide. What kind of programs do you want? What kind of services do you want? What do you want your district councils to look like? All of those kind. Right now, we can't even do that if we want to because it's dictated to us what we have to do according to the Societies Act. And again, I'm gonna say, I've heard that all my life. We need to get out of the Societies Act and be able to design our own structure. That's a big one. As far as I'm concerned, depending which government is in power, I'll give you a perfect example. We have a government in Alberta, and none of them have, a, have I guess you'd say, openly worked with us, but some of them a little bit more than others. When I came to work for the Métis Nation of Alberta in 1991, we had a budget of $1.5 million for the Métis people. Today, well, not, yeah, to, not even today, uh, by the end of last fiscal year, we had $1.5 million. We got a letter telling us we were being cut $300,000 for this coming fiscal year. Does that even make sense in today's world? But that's what we live with, how someone else determines for us what is right for us. So I think there's a lot of important things that will change how we are be able to deliver services to Métis people, the resources that we will be able to have that we've never had the opportunity of accessing. And I say that very clearly because we don't have legislation yet. We don't have our constitution approved yet, but we do have a self-government agreement that started us on that process. And over this last two years, we have been able to negotiate harvesting agreements for 10, uh, not harvesting, housing agreements for 10 years. We've been able to access early learning and childcare support that we have never had all the time that I've been around. And now we have a 10 year agreement to design what our early learning and childcare facilities should look like and how they would be funded. So I see just in this short while, amazing things have changed for us. And I see even more when we can say goodbye to the Societies Act and move under a model that our people determine. Thank you. Hopefully I answered you. Yes, it did, very well. My last question, and I'll be brief, is in my previous job, I experienced dealing with three different provincial governments, PC, NDP, and UCP. And the one thing I learned, many things are very common. And my concern is uh, we have a federal government that is friendly to the Métis Nation, um, and there's possibility next year there might be a different government that's not. So I think it's, uh, I'd like your honesty is, what is our true window of opportunity for the Métis Nation in terms of the importance of getting a constitution done sooner than, because I've had people, why not wait five years? What will it matter? So I'll take a kick at that as well. <laughs> so in my experience and moving forward with the federal government we have today, we all know that no one can ever count on when a government is gonna fall. I believe that this federal government that has been supportive of us. <coughs> and I know there's lots of people probably even in this room that don't agree with this federal government. But I say for the Métis, we've had more done 
in the last three to four years than we've probably had in 20 years that I know of. So I see, I see right now, I believe they've got a little longer life, but who knows how long that'll be. And I know even as recently as last week when I was in Batash, I had another meeting with the Minister of Indigenous Services, then the Minister of, of Crown Relations. And he has still indicated to me that they are going forward with legislation for this fall. That tells me that they are committed to working with us. And they are committed to finally look at one of the Indigenous people getting a little closer to being equal to the rest of the Indigenous people in this country. And that's important to me. And I just hope we don't lose that opportunity. How exactly long it'll be, I don't know. But I think the sooner we can take advantage of moving forward and getting it done, the better it is for all of us. Thank you. Thank you. And I'd just like to say briefly, you had a very tough job, the whole commission. Everybody is passionate about the way they want to do, but having total consensus is, is not possible. You can only do the best you can and debate it out. And uh, thank you for all your work. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we've got um, number one and number two. Oh, and then we got number four. Okay. Oh, number two was sooner. Number four was sooner. Okay. Go ahead, number four. Thank you, Madam President. Brian Hamlin, Southern Free Maiti Territory. I just have one question uh, as pertaining to Chapter 6, 6.1G. <coughs> I'll read out the clause that says, the right to mobility throughout the Maiti homeland. Now, does that mean we have the right to travel around? Or should it be the mobility of our rights in the homeland? Uh, I'm, presuming, I'm presuming Zach wants to answer that. But you know what I, I want to say uh, to Brian and to specifically to the people down here in Region 3? I think when we took a court case forward, that was a huge step towards mobility. I know we lost it, but if anybody wants to look at the 45 boxes of information that was put there, there was a lot of mobility in that, in that court action. So I certainly believe it's about, it's about all, true mobility, but Zach, I think you need to legally answer it probably. So in terms of mobility of rights, that we believe was captured in 6.1 E, when we're talking about harvesting across the homeland. And, you know, there's some reasons that we worded it the way that we did, and we've talked about that in response to an earlier question. The right to mobility across the homeland, that is actually in response to feedback that was received about the Jay Treaty and people wanting to go to the homeland and have access, or the right to access the homeland in Montana and North Dakota recognized. So uh, that's what that's about. That's about uh, bringing the whole homeland together, including in the northern United States. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. My thanks to the committee and everyone else that made my last 30 years of assemblies enjoyable. <laughs> I think, Brian, did you want to, yeah. want to say something? So, Brian, people have asked us why they can't harvest across the provinces. We don't have any authority in other provinces. That doesn't mean we don't try, and doesn't mean we don't say it, and doesn't mean we go and, don't, we go and negotiate with the other provinces. We need to continue to pursue this. So we said we want this to happen. Uh, they'll try to stop us, and we'll continue to pursue that. But we say we want that, and we're going to do that. <coughs> Thanks, Brian. Okay, number one. Hi, um, my name is Grant Britton. I'm from Region 3, originally from Saskatchewan, actually, and I just got back from back to Batosh, and I actually saw Audrey Dare when I was there, and all my family's back there, but I, I'm mobile. Métis have been mobile all for hundreds of years. And so I want to follow up on the last gentleman's comment. Brian, is, was it? I think the Constitution, as it presently sits, in six point one C has a comment that reflects the way of life, the way of life of the Métis. And using that comment alone, 
just that one phrase, we can squeeze everything we've done over the last few hundred years, whether it's dealing with historical medicine, because my grandma used to live with babies and, and I used to help her pick the herbs at different times of year for different reasons. I didn't know because I was only this big, but I still remember doing it and they would tell me not to do it this time and, or do it this way. So the Constitution is a stepping stone and I think Ward touched on it as a framework for the next step to move because as a society, you know, we're way down here in, in the legislative structure, but if we go up with a constitution, we're equal in the equation between federal and provincial governments and it gives us the power to do exactly what he was saying, negotiate and use the levers that presently exist in the constitution going back to the 1763 Royal Proclamation to actually do what we need to do as a Métis nation. And I think it's time, and everybody agrees, and I've been in this business a long time, that it's time that we've done something because we've gone as far as we can go with the present model and we've got to take a step forward and then use that clause, simple detailed clauses like that, to squeeze and create laws to address a lot of the issues that have been properly brought up today. And I think it's possible to do so. So that's my observation. And I'd like to thank you guys for all your hard work because I've dealt with a lot of this stuff over the decades. And this is a really good piece of work. We're 99% there. And I think it's time to move on and get it done. Thank you. Thanks, Grant. I think Karen wants to speak to you. I just want to add that uh, one of, this, one of our thoughts that as we gathered at each of our meetings was not only to look at what have we done in the past and what do we want to fix that, but very much forward looking. Try to be as forward looking as we possibly could. So a lot of these pieces that you will read in there are aspirational for the next generation, for the generations yet to come. So some of those pieces that we talked about that said, well, what, are, what do we mean we can hunt across the homeland? Well, in the future governments that are coming, it's already in your constitution. Work towards what we put in there for aspirations for our future generations in the Métis Nation. I just want to add that. Thanks, Karen. <coughs> okay, number two, go ahead. I always like to have the last word, just <laughs> saying. <laughs> The only thing I want to tell all of you is everything is great, and like I said, in principle, I support the Constitution. I'm not sure if I agree that it's 99% perfect, but maybe 90. <laughs> but the problem that I have that you guys were not straight with us today, you asked us to come up here and feed into what you were presenting without telling us that it wouldn't matter what we said, it, because what you did was what we were putting forward without any consideration what anybody was bringing off the floor. And I think that you should have done that. Uh, and I also don't necessarily agree that you can't still do some amendments before you, because I understand the motion tomorrow is to proceed to ratification. It doesn't approve the existing draft constitution. Yep, you're right. That's what it says. So yes, it is to proceed to ratification though, for sure. That is exactly because that's the process that has been laid out. Um, I, I think where I was coming from when I said probably not, this whole process has been about input, coming to a position, taking it to the citizens, input, coming to the, to the citizens, and once again for the third time. That's what I was going by, is that we've gone all across the province asking people and we've come to this I just thought, does it really make sense to say, oh, now we went and we changed things and, and made some changes at the last minute? I don't, I don't know, and I, I, when I, I, I'm not sure, Zach, I hear you saying too that based on 
I don't know if it's a process or what it is, but um, we shouldn't be able to make, we, or we can't, I guess, make make changes. I'm not sure what that, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a, I'm just me. <laughs> I just know the way I, I saw it going, and that's where we had got to was to say, based on all of this feedback, this is what we got, and that's what we're bringing forward. And for me, we have a provincial council that's been elected to do work for the Métis Nation, and just like they made the resolution that some people didn't like to go to a special assembly, we took it to a special assembly, and we had double the amount of people according to the structure we have today that approved it. They've done the same thing again. They've come to a council meeting and said, let's now take this to the assembly. So that's the motion that's been out there saying we're bringing it now to the assembly to ask the citizens once again. And so that's what I, and we were presenting it today, so I thought, how do you present it today and then change it to something else that they have asked to go forward? That was my reasoning for say, and I don't think it can change, but I, I'm not sure if that's the end result or not. I'm just explaining to you what, why I said that. Anybody else? I never said no? it, so I'm going to have to respond. Okay, I guess that's... Um, pardon me? Number three. Oh, last, number three. Last one. Oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Lindsay Tate in Region 3. I noticed that the right to security isn't in there. Is there a reason why? It's in there. It's in there. Oh, is there? Okay, there maybe There is security I... in there for sure. Okay, a past thoughts, I think. Okay. Um, and just going back to Section 10... Um, it still really concerns me that there still isn't some kind of protection for the Métis people. Um, even with Section 35 with the Canadian government, when the Canadian government invokes Section 1, it's irrelevant, it's null and void, so we're not protected by it. So same thing with Section 10, once it's invoked, our rights could be null and void, technically. So I'm wondering if we can add in there in accordance with an individual sovereign rights or natural law. So the way that this would work is if it's invoked, it does not automatically mean that you have no rights. Um, you have the right to go to the judicial branch and to argue that the, the limit on your right being imposed by the Métis government in the law is not a reasonable limit uh, that can be justified in a free and democratic Macy's Same society. with what's going on with the Canadian government right now, but who has thousands of dollars to fight that? You, ha you, ha you have the right to challenge the laws. I mean, it, that's what it is, and there'll be processes in place to, I hope, ensure that there is access to justice in the judicial branch, but you can challenge the laws of the new government on the basis that they unjustifiably infringe your right. Yeah, no, I understand that is just after the fact, right? So if it's invoked, then if we want our rights to medical freedom and whatnot, we still have to go through the same process that's happening in the Canadian court system right now, is what I'm saying. So I'm concerned about that. I think we're very close with this constitution, but th section 10 is very concerning for me. So thank you for your time. Okay, and thank you very much for your input. Okay. Go ahead, number three. Okay, <clears throat> this is a quick statement because we we'll only get to the rodeo or whatever. <laughs> but a gentleman just got up here and said there might be a federal election in 2023. Well, that's not going to happen. With the, with the support of the NDP, with the federal government, the Liberals, they don't have to call an election until 2025, March. And, that w and that's what, where it's going to be with the support of the NDP. So we got time to get this Constitution re ready for everybody's approval across the board. Okay? Now, governments change. Governments change, especially in Alberta. And it is going to change. So in my draft report, I state, there should be no borders across this province 
for hunting and fishing rights, the south, the east, the west, and the north have, should have the same right. <clears throat> and with Rachel Notley, the NDP leader in power, that's going to happen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Okay, anybody else? Go ahead, go ahead, Brian. I just wanted to help uh, with that young lady there. She was talking about security, but the language we use in... Um, I think you need to talk closer to your mic. Talk closer to the mic. Um, I just seen it now. I got all sidetracked. On 6.1L, so we talk about the right to safety. So again, that's a matter of trans translation. That can be translated into security as well. So it, like I said, we, we had to restrain ourselves from so many different words. So just wanted to add that, give you something to think about on that one. Thank you very much, Brian. Okay, I don't see anybody else at the mic. And I know some people have cleared out if they're going to the, to the barbecue and the rodeo. And so I want to just say thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for your input. Uh, thank you for the discussions we've had. And enjoy your evening. And we'll see you all tomorrow. Thank you. Who's going to closing prayer?